Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this fireside chat. It's great to have the opportunity to chat with you, Dries, on the topic of funding and open source projects. Maybe we can kick this off by you introducing yourself. Sure. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? You yep. can? Awesome. Yeah, so my name is Dries. Um, let's see, originally from Belgium. Um, I started the Drupal project when I was a student at the University of Antwerp, and that's actually like 20, over 20 years ago, so a long time ago. And I have been the project lead uh, for all that time. Uh, and so, you know, with that experience, I've seen a lot of different things in open source. And actually, before I started Drupal, I was also involved with some other open source projects. Uh, but anyway, I did Drupal for seven years as a hobby project, if you will. It, it's what I would do at night, on the weekends. Uh, and then, you know, eventually ended up starting uh, Acquia. So I co-founded Acquia, and Acquia is a technology company. And um, it's really born out of Drupal, born out of open source, uh, with the goal to make large organizations successful uh, with Drupal. And we do that by providing a variety of uh, products and services. And today, we've, you know, grown beyond Drupal, if you will. It's not the only thing that we do. Um, you know, we're contributing to Modic as well, for example, today. Um, and so, yeah, involved with open source in a variety of different ways. So that's kind of the, I guess, short or medium length intro. I'm not sure. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, my name is Ruth Cheesley. For those of you who don't know me, I'm based in the UK and I'm currently project lead for Mortic. So I've been a Mortic user since the really early days. In fact, I still keep coming across issues that I raised back then on GitHub. Um, I used it as a, as a marketer and a digital agency and built a business around uh, Joomla and Mortic. So before I got involved in Mortic, I was a contributor in the, the Joomla project and I was on the community leadership team for several years with the Joomla project. So I'd say I've probably been involved in open source around about 10 years, something like that. I also came across it when I was at uni and couldn't afford to pay for all these tools that I needed for my laptop and found lots of open source tools, didn't know what open source was and just kind of fell into it, I guess, uh, mostly by having a problem and then people saying, why don't you help be a part of the solution? So that's how I kind of became a contributor, but through a non-traditional route, so not through the developer route. So, yeah, so it's great to be able to chat a bit about funding and open source. I mean, from my perspective, it's a very topical thing in Maltic at the moment because we're exploring different ways that we can raise and use the funds in the project. So maybe we could start by talking a bit more generally about funding and open source. Do you think there's a problem from your perspective as someone who's been involved over many years? Um, yeah, I do, actually. Um, it's funny because I feel like you know, open source has been around for a very long time, obviously. And in my mind, in many ways, open source has won, if you will. Like, you know, every pretty much every organization uses open source, right? So it's an incredible success story. However, <laughs> the one thing that remains really hard is, you know, making open source sustainable. And obviously funding is kind of at the at the core of that. And um you know, I think it's one of the biggest unsolved problems for open source. Like, and to the point that I believe that if we can really figure out good funding and sustainability models for open source, um, that it could kind of be like the last hurdle, you know, for open source in the sense that if we had good funding mechanisms, we, I think open source could take off in a way that we, you know, probably can't even imagine, you know, like, and it's already so successful despite uh, some of these uh, funding challenges. So, you know, I think it's what's between today and open source literally taking over the world, you know? And so, yeah, I think it's really important. What about yourself, Ruth? Yeah, I mean, I think something that, I, that I've really noticed and learned for myself over the last year is that not everyone has the luxury of free time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a real luxury that people have and a lot of people don't. And so 
if we rely on open source contributions only being done by people who are doing it in their free time, firstly, we're excluding a lot of people who may be able to contribute if they were able to be recompensed in some way for their time. Um, particularly people who have caring responsibilities, people who maybe aren't able to spend their spare time um, contributing to open source. But also I feel like that would uh, give us an opportunity to reach more people, people who may then get more of a sense or an understanding of open source and be interested in finding out more and potentially contributing. But it's a thorny subject, you know, um, paying people to contribute in open source. And there's lots of different ways that that could be done directly or by companies hiring people to actually work in the project full time or part time. I know that's something that has been explored at Acquia with the Drupal Acceleration team, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, when we started Acquia, we, you know, we really felt like we wanted to help accelerate Drupal. And we also felt like for Drupal to become really successful, uh, we needed several people that were full time, you know, uh, because mm -hmm. as much as we obviously love, you know, volunteer contributors are very important. We can talk about that in a bit if you want. Um, it can also be hard for a certain class of problems uh, to be solved by you know just you know volunteers right like some projects that we do at aquia with the drupal acceleration team or our team of full-time contributors um you know take months of like four or five mm -hmm. people and uh, could be very hard to do um through volunteers that may be able to you know spend or you know give a couple hours a week like it would literally take years if you will to get certain things done and so the model of combining, uh, you know, volunteers with paid contributors, I think is a great model. But as you pointed out, it's not without controversy. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I've been in many conversations where people feel like, well, as soon as you start paying people in an open source project, you are going to, you know, almost corrupt, if you will, the open source project, um, or it's going to stop volunteers from contributing altogether. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like fears, I would say, out there and people mm -hmm. sort of speculating of what may or may not happen once you start paying people. Um, yeah, we've been doing that at Drupal for a while now and I would say with great results. You know, I think we continue mm -hmm. to have quite a few volunteers, uh, but also, um, you know, quite a few paid contributors today. Yeah, I think what, what... I'll speak to that as well about transparency in a minute. But I think one of the other things that I've noticed is like burnout is a real thing in open source, you know, and if we are relying on volunteers and it's kind of like you you sort of put your head above the parapet and say, oh, I'd like to help with something. And suddenly you just get deluged with something and you're doing that in your spare time. Um, people can cannot handle that sometimes, you know, right. like they get given more responsibility and actually their life and their work has to take priority at some point. And so what we've seen, particularly in our project where we've got quite a small number of people contributing, is people come in, they're really interested, keen and enthusiastic. They do a bit of work and then they just disappear. And in some ways that can be really detrimental to a project, particularly if you've got a feature that they're working on and suddenly no one else knows how it works. Mm -hmm. So I also feel like having that, that could be an issue that could be addressed as well, potentially. Yeah, no, um, I agree. Um, it helps with burnouts for sure. Um, you know, especially when you have you know volunteer contributors that are so passionate that they're like they're throwing themselves into the project, you know, with kind of with full force. And sometimes it's a little bit self-inflicted, you know, in, in a way mm -hmm. where they get so passionate about contributing that they can take over a large part of their life. Um, and it's not like somebody's telling them to do that. It's again often themselves um, being so passionate that causes it. But um, makes it hard to have a good work-life balance. Obviously, it's sometimes these yeah. people. It's like they have two jobs. You know, one is their paid job, <laughs> and then one is their open mm -hmm. source job. And then uh, often have a family to juggle and other other kinds of responsibilities as well. And so it can be overwhelming mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I believe in in paying people um, and having paid contributors um, for mm -hmm. those reasons. And as you mentioned, um, you know, people from underrepresented groups um, can really struggle to be volunteers, right? They may want to be part of Modic, let's say, but it's really hard. And as mm -hmm. you as you as you alluded to, or as you mentioned, even like women, you know, research. Uh, shows that women still today uh, spend more than double the amount of time doing unpaid domestic work, if you will, like, you know, childcare mm -hmm. or uh, house care, housework, whatever, um, compared to their, um, compared to male, uh, you know, husbands, like literally mm -hmm. double the amount of time. And that's obviously making it really hard for women to contribute as much as men do. Yeah. something that i've seen and something that i've heard and honestly it's reflected in the numbers mm -hmm. like technology in general has really poor diversity and like gender diversity as an example of mm -hmm. that is pretty bad but in open source mm -hmm. that's even worse <laughs> you know it's even worse compared to um you know in software companies for example so open source is a real diversity issue and um you know, one way to help overcome that, I'm not saying that the only problem is that they're not being paid. There's other systemic issues here, but one of the problems is the privilege of free time, as you mentioned. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, paying people to mm -hmm. contribute to open source solves that and would allow more women, for example, to contribute, you know, which would obviously be beneficial um, to the project of better diversity. But yeah. that's just one example. It's not limited to gender diversity. It's same thing with geographic diversity, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, a lot of great reasons, mm -hmm. I think. From yeah, and I found the diversity. issue of like, sorry, I was no, going to say, yeah, I found I the on. issue of like um, concerns about corrupting the project. A lot of the time that can be addressed with transparency. Mm -hmm. So it, when we have like, Pull requests in the community to add a new feature for example we make sure that the person who makes that pull request is different from the person who's reviewing it for example so we can't have a company that like decides there needs to be this feature in Maltic and they pay their developers to work on it don't involve anyone in the community like there's always mm -hmm. that check of having other people in the community to review those but also if we're paying people in our community to work on things that now all goes to our open collective so there's financial transparency there. Our initiatives have all got a budget. If we have tasks that we need to bring in a contractor, the community, the whole community can see the tasks that are being paid for and the money and the budget that's available. And I feel like that's sort of like where we need to go if we're gonna bring finance into open source to give people the confidence. Yeah, I mean, I think that's well said, actually. Um, I think that transparency is, is key. and. And actually, to sort of double click on that, if you will, I think the reason that is key is because if you mix paid contributors with volunteer contributors, if you mix business with vol you know volunteers, right? I think the volunteers are okay with that as long as they feel like there is equality and justice, mm -hmm. if you will, and as long decisions are made in the public interest, in the interest of the project as a whole, right? Like if yeah. corporations get involved and they and decisions all of a sudden are made only in the corporate interest, but not in the interest of uh, the other stakeholders, like the volunteers themselves. That's I think when the people get angry <laughs> and when it starts to break down, right? And so the transparency is key, but also sort of the right processes so that you keep mm -hmm. that um you know sort of unbiased decision making always acting in the best interest of the project as a whole as a whole and sometimes that goes against the interest of the companies that are involved mm. sometimes it also goes against the interest of the volunteers that are involved but on a whole it needs to be balanced and fair right and so that's yeah so that's why i totally agree with you when you say that 
that transparency is key. But obviously, you could have transparency and a lot of bad decisions. <laughs> that yeah, won't do that's, the trick. that's very but like, true. <laughs> uh, but like, yeah. you, you need to have the right decision-making systems. Like, like you mentioned, like the person contributing the code is not necessarily the person uh, approving mm. or committing the code, or you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And you want to have a you want to have diversity in your leadership team too. You know, yeah, like, I feel like that's really important, actually, that that people can see that anyone can step up and take ownership of a tiger team or an initiative or, you know, anyone can can work towards being part of the team leaders or it, it, the leaders or um, assistant team leads. And there's a clear path to that in each team um, rather than it just being like a favoritism thing. Mm -hmm. um feel like that's really important and also what i was just going to say one of the things i've learned from trying to be as transparent as we can in mortic is that when you're that transparent you fail in the public <laughs> and you know like everybody sees your mistakes so you know that can be quite challenging for some people to be in that kind of environment where we're working mm -hmm. openly together um, so do but i do feel like that? it's important yeah how do you help people get comfortable with some of these things so I think by exemplifying it myself, mm -hmm. that's a really important thing as project lead. So kind of when we started working, all the tasks I was working on, I put on a Trello board that was open to everyone. So people could see what I was working on. Um, and I mentioned the open collective. So we started that up in November last year as a way for people to see the money that was being raised in the Morticon event and what we were doing with it, how we were supporting the community. Um, but it's a mind it's a mindset shift for people who are used to working in corporate environments where everything's closed down and locked down you know and you wouldn't share your finances although i know that friendly one of our partners actually share all of their both business finances publicly every month which i find really interesting so there are some shifts happening there but generally people do find it a bit uncomfortable um mm -hmm. and likewise receiving feedback can be challenging so it's sort of like helping people learn how to give constructive feedback in the mm -hmm. community in a positive way to help each other and be willing to hear that feedback yourself. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, a good mentoring, mm -hmm. I think, in general, uh, you know, good mentorship programs, et cetera, to help people get involved and give them comfort, you know, along mm -hmm. the way about what's normal, what's not normal. And even accelerate their journey, you know, it can be intimidating in many ways to contribute. So people, people yeah. drop off left and right because there's just too many things to learn. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think mentorships can really help with that. Yeah. And even like when we create our budget, basically we ask all of the team leads to talk with their teams about what they think they might need to spend money on. Mm -hmm. So the product team probably has more of a role here with the initiatives. But other teams can put in requests and then we actually pull that up into a community budget, which we use for the year. So next year will be our first year of formally going through that process. But that process is going to be open to everyone to see what we're actually doing and deciding. And you can see the money being spent on open collectives. So also like encouraging people to be a part of that. If they feel like there's an area of Mortic that could be improved if we had a bit of funding put behind it. Mm -hmm. They can put together a proposal, propose a community initiative, say how much they feel like is going to be needed in funding to deliver that if funding's needed. And then we can look to raise it in the community. So we're kind of exploring different ways to drive improvement and innovations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think so far we, we agree that, um, you know, volunteer volunteers are very important. And we also mm -hmm. agree that paid contributions are very valuable and can be very important. Um, so then the question is, and we talked about how you, you know, balance the two. So it's a healthy mm. balance, I guess, between the two, um, you know, different groups. Um, but if funded work is valuable, the challenge is how do you get the funding, right? And that's right. where a lot of open source projects you know i think struggle with um so i'm not sure if you've seen things in modic or even joomla before uh, modic uh, that worked really well or things that didn't work really well i don't know if you have any perspective on um sort of a best practice or something 
Yeah. So in Joomla, there were quite a lot of corporate sponsors who would pay like a certain amount per year at different tiers to open source matters. And they would then be featured prominently on the website with backlinks. They would be in emails that go out to people. There are different. I think you have that in the Drupal Association as well, right, with different levels of partners and things. Mm -hmm. um, that was very successful. And events like this, when you turn a profit on those events, that fund, those funds can also go to the community. Um, and we've recently implemented that in the Mortic community. So we have the ability to sponsor through GitHub sponsors as an individual or an organization, and also through our open collective directly. And we've got our partners program, which is relatively new. So you have to be a financial sponsor to be a partner and to be active in the community. You can't do one and not the other. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we've been investigating that in Mortic, um, encouraging people to support us, but also having that uh, program where we have both sides of the importance for our contributions, finances, and being active in the community. And I mean, so far it's working quite well. Mm -hmm. And we have several partners who signed up, and we've got one more who'll be joining us next month. All right, so, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that works well, and we use something similar in the Drupal project. Um, maybe another tip, um, something that I've seen and actually experienced myself is, uh, let's say you're an individual in the modic community, and you want somebody to sponsor you mm. specifically, right? How do you get sponsorship? <laughs> so I can tell you two quick stories um, and then kind of make a conclusion, I think. Um, so at some point, I think it was 2000, I'm going to say five or something, a while ago, over 15 years ago, um, you know, Drupal.org, it was you know obviously our website, uh, stopped scaling. And we had so much traffic to Drupal.org that I, I needed to buy a new server. And I didn't have any money. I was a student. Like I literally could not afford <laughs> to buy a new server. And um, at some point, the site literally crashed because there was so much traffic and it's kind of dead in the water almost. Um, and so all I could think of at the time was to replace every page on Drupal.org to, to a blank page, an empty white page. And in the middle, there was a button, a PayPal button and a little bit of text below it. And it said, uh, you know, we need $4,000, I think it was. Uh, and once we have $4,000, we will buy a new server and the site will be back. And um, something amazing happened. Like within 24 hours, people had contributed $10,000 in funding. <laughs> and I changed my PayPal password to be like this long and um, <laughs> PayPal blocked the account for <laughs> suspicious traffic because the first three or four years of Drupal, I've gotten like $50 in funding total, you know, and all of a sudden in like 24 hours, I get $10,000. Anyway, <laughs> um, Sun Microsystems, um, at the time a famous company uh, have been acquired by Oracle, I believe. Uh, one of their CTOs emailed and said, hey, we've been using Drupal at Sun and uh, we shipped you a server. I was like a $7,000 server. Um, and so anyway, all of a sudden, within 24 hours, we had all this money and a server, right? Um, and for me, the lesson then was, you know, be clear about what you need and what you will do in return. And I see a lot of people in open source projects that would love, love, love to get funding, but they're not able to make a good ask. You know what I mean? And uh, we've seen it recently with another example in the Drupal community uh, where, you know, Matt, one of our developers, needed funding to do something. And again, for the longest time, he got zero funding despite a lot of people using his, mm -hmm. um, you know, tool. Like it's a, it's a tool that the Drupal community uses uh, quite a bit to help with migrations anyway. It doesn't really matter for this audience, but... Um, at some point he got really specific and he said, I need, and I forgot what it was, you know, I need $2,500 and in return, I will do this <laughs> mm -hmm. and you'll get it in, I don't know, two weeks. You know, it's like, think about it as a proposal almost that you put out, like you do this, 
here's specifically what I need and how I'm going to use it, the money. And here's what I will give to you and the rest of the community in return and be very precise. And I think if you do that, your chances of actually getting funding, they just, you know, they go through the roof. You know, I'm not saying you will get funding, but all of a sudden you go from almost no chance of getting funding to, I think, a fair, a fair chance of getting funding, depending on what it is you're asking money for. But I've seen it work, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is coming from people that have contributed and contributed and contributed for years and years and years and have gotten zero funding for really important work. And it wasn't until they made a strong, specific ask that they actually got the funding. So anyway, that would be my tip, if you will, my best practice. Uh, if you are an individual looking to get paid to work on Modic or any other mm -hmm. open source project. Yeah, and also we have some interesting options available nowadays that weren't available before. So individuals, maybe developers, can be sponsored themselves on GitHub sponsors. And potentially we could sponsor them from Mautic. You know, so if there right. are developers who we know do really great work in the community, but they're going to have to scale back what they do because they have to focus on their paid work. That's an option we are exploring at the moment is, well, could we pay for them to do a certain number of hours a week to help us with triaging and code reviewing our pull requests so we can get more features and bugs fixed in each release? Because that's one of the biggest blockers we have, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that's tools are getting option. better, which is great. The right? tools are, are getting better. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're also um, looking at, I don't know if you've heard of the Fund OSS project, but that's something that's really exciting that we're involved in at the moment. Um, I've heard about it, project. but I don't know enough about it. So <laughs> Yeah, it's a really interesting project. Basically, they've secured a pool of funding, $75,000, and they've invited 55 open source projects to join. And all of those open source projects have a landing page where they can encourage people to contribute. And as a project, you'll receive all of those funds. It's all done through Open Collective, so it will be transparent, like I was saying earlier. But then if the, the organizations who get the most contributors, not necessarily the most amount of money raised, but the most amount of people backing them, will receive more of that $75,000. So it's kind of, a, it's called democratic funding. Um, and they're trying it out in open source. It's come from other uh, communities and it's the first time they're trying it here so it's not perfect i mean there's some some ways that it's not great in open source world mm -hmm. really because you're competing projects against each other and the more popular ones will will win and mm -hmm. really you want to fund the smaller ones but it is also right. exposing some of those smaller projects that you may never have seen before that you can really easily back with like five ten twenty dollars mm -hmm. or whatever so I think that's really interesting that they are exploring other models and other ways to fund things. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Yeah, I think that's exactly what needs to happen, you know. As I mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning, I think figuring out the funding and sustainability models and getting, there's enough money in the world to fund pretty much all open source in the world, you know. But it's yeah. just getting, making the connections and incentivizing people to, you know, to sponsor or, um, you know, pay, you know, as, as commercial entities for open source work. And it's hard, like, I don't feel like the incentive models are properly aligned uh, all mm -hmm. the time. It's too much altruism based. And um, but I think that has its limits, sadly. Yeah. So what would you say to people in open source projects who are really against there being money introduced into the equation for contributing to projects or supporting contributors to be involved in open source? When they're really against it, um, I mean, it's almost more of a, a value or a principle. I mean, I understand why some people, uh, you know, op I would say open source is a spectrum, I guess, where some people do open source because they're violently against commercialism, you know, <laughs> it's sort of a, a renegade movement against corporations. And, you know, I, I get it. Um, but that's not me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm more pragmatic. I believe in the power of open source and the 
it being a superior development methodology and a superior way to deliver uh, a very high quality software product uh, that many mm -hmm. people can use. I believe in open source empowering millions and billions of people. So, mm -hmm. but um, I'm okay with um, commercial interests. I really am. And, and I believe that um, ultimately if your project wants to become large, you almost always have to have some sort of commercial ecosystem around the project. I mean, think about all of the large open source projects that mm -hmm. all have commercial interests. I can tell mm -hmm. you that Drupal wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't for the fact that we have a large commercial ecosystem, you know, mm -hmm. with thousands of Drupal shops and hundreds of thousands of developers getting paid to build Drupal sites, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it was the same in, in Joomla. And I'm sure, well, and we're starting to see that in Modic too, you know, where there is a healthy and growing ecosystem around the project and ultimately, um, that's a that's a great thing, you know, and um, and it doesn't it, and it only accelerates some of these benefits mm -hmm. that open source can bring to the world, you know. So, yeah, I think it's personally, I think it's um, short sighted to be against commercial interest, but I'm also very respectful of the position because, you know, I know people are coming from different viewpoints. Uh, and, and that's okay too, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think I think it's really important as well that we give people lots of different ways to contribute. Mm. No, like it's not only about finance, and it's not only about giving us the money to pay for things. So organizations can also say, "You've got a developer who works for you five days a week." You could say, mm. on a Friday or you know half a day a week they are tasked with working for the Mortic community. So you're still paying for them to actually work, but they're actually gonna spend their time in the community. Um, and I feel like that benefits the organization that's doing that as well. You've probably found this at Acquia because like, it doesn't help you when there's bug fixes that haven't been tested mm -hmm. and released or features mm -hmm. that you want that are not quite ready. And right. so by giving people lots of different ways to contribute, um i think that will help us to grow as a community yeah i agree um yeah a lot of companies that i that i know of do something like that they give uh you know percentage of employee time to open source could be mm -hmm. a day could be half a day could be a couple hours a week uh so that's one thing that i've seen <clears throat> and that's actually a win win you know it's good for uh, retention of these employees it's it's like a an mm -hmm. awesome benefit, right that you get from your company um but it can also be good for the company itself because i've seen many companies compete for business and being able to say hey we actually helped build this feature <laughs> um is a great way to win business versus maybe a competitor that mm -hmm. doesn't contribute like you know if you can say well actually we we help we help develop Modic. <laughs> you know, here's some of the things that we've done that we've contributed. It's it's a great way to showcase expertise and to win uh, more business mm -hmm. compared to other people. Um, I would say other things I've seen that are a little bit more unique is in Drupal, we have certain large uh, end users of Drupal that um, will hire a lot of Drupal shops uh, and they mandate that these shops uh, contribute. So one example is Pfizer, actually. It's a, a large Drupal user, thousands of Drupal sites. And they will only work with development companies that have a proven track record of contributing to Drupal. And, yeah. and that's awesome, right? Because now it's the end user between, quote, the customer that's pushing contribution from its development partners. And um, a lot of companies want to work with Pfizer. And you know, in order to do so, you have to contribute, you know? So that's cool. And, yeah. and I've seen the same thing happen in other organizations like the state of um, uh, the state of Georgia in, in, in the US, you know, like a, 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 obviously a, a government organization 
doing the same thing. You know, they're demanding their vendors, their shops, to contribute. Otherwise, they can't even qual they can't even submit, respond to an RFP, uh, which is awesome. You know, so it's a, a very cool, unique new thing that I've seen in the last couple of years, and I, I hope that we'll see more of that. And and it's smart to do that because as a as an end user, as a customer, it, there's two benefits at a minimum. One, um, you're giving back to the project, which obviously if you make a big strategic investment in, let's say, Modic, you want Modic to be healthy and you want Modic to receive contributions, right? So that's that's good. But the second reason is also smart in that, like, by working with organizations that contribute to Modic, you know you're working with some of the best organizations in the world, you know, versus people that claim they can do Modic, but maybe have barely done any Modic work, right? So you get actually a better quality product in return. Like, you know, you're more likely to succeed by working with organizations that contribute. So uh, it's a great strategy and we should encourage more end users to to work with those that give back. Yeah, that would be great if everyone who puts out any kind of tender for Mautic related work stated that they had to be a contributor to the Mautic project in order to apply. Certainly in the community when people are asking for help or hosted services or things like that, we're now much more strong with promoting our partners. Mm -hmm. A, because we know that they do a good job, but also because they're actually helping keep the community going. You know, they're contributing mm -hmm. in meaningful ways. Right. And so from our perspective, why wouldn't you not promote those people? Because it results in there being more energy in the community if they grow and thrive. Yeah, that's so, right. Like Modic benefits from driving all business to those that give back. Yeah, and absolutely. That's, that's um, sort of a very black and white statement, but I do believe in it. You know, like let's say, let's say somebody's going to spend 100 euros on Modic, you want the 100 euros to go to a contributor, frankly, because when that contributor makes 100 euros, they may give back two of the 100 euros or five, I don't know, it doesn't matter, versus the 100 going to somebody that doesn't contribute ever, right? And then exactly zero goes back to Modic. It's like, a, it's like a, I call it the open source dividend um, for those mm. that, uh, you know, understand a little bit about dividend and investing but <laughs> you want to invest in those things that you know create a little bit of a dividend for the open source community yeah and so absolutely. yeah absolutely that's something yeah. you can control as an open source project by promoting those that give back yeah 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 great well, we've got about 20 minutes left. So usually at this point, we go to questions. I wonder if there are any questions in the channel. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like me or Dries to answer, hello. please do drop them in the chat. OK. Uh, hello. I really enjoyed hey. this section. And uh, we do have some questions. Uh, yeah. Would love for you and Grace to answer. I think the first question here is: uh, Modic is not known in some places. How can Modic gain that much recognition in the open source space? Mm. I could answer that one, I guess. Okay, so I sure. feel like I feel like that is very okay. much about growing our marketing team and helping people who don't know about Mautic learn about it. So we've been very, very shorthanded in that area in the community recently. So we've basically been trying to just do as much as we can. But I feel like if we can get a few more really awesome marketers on board to help us with that, we can start to spread our wings and get outside of our bubble. So to, we can start to reach people who are maybe looking at marketing automation are interested in open source but haven't come across us yet um and i mean i found going to the fosdem event has been really great for raising awareness of people who are big fans of open source but have never heard of mortic because they all hang out at that event european generally anyway they all hang out at that event and 
last year it was um this year sorry it was virtual the year before that it was in person and that was my last in-person event before the covid pandemic hit so do you have any thoughts on that question dries i think that's a good answer i would have something to add um okay, sure. yeah so i think one of the things looking back at drupal um you know we like one of the things that can really help boost the adoption and the awareness is like great references, you know, like um, people switching from, let's say, Marketo to Modic, but like not just anyone, but, you know, brands. Um, like an example in the Drupal project was in 2009, uh, President Obama, um, you know, adopted uh, Drupal for whitehouse.gov, you know, and replaced some proprietary piece of software. It was huge, you know, and everybody talked about it and it gave us a lot of credibility given the scalability needs as well as the security needs of, you know, whitehouse.gov, right? So these are the kinds of things you want, I think, in Modic, like, mm -hmm. because if you are a marketer, a CMO, or even maybe a CIO, and you have to decide, do we go with Marketo or Modic? You need those examples to go with mm -hmm. Modic. You know what I mean? Like you need to feel like other large organizations, my size and in my industry, or even bigger than I have, mm -hmm. than my organization have successfully um, switched. Um, and so that's something that obviously a marketer can help promote, which is what Ruth is suggesting. But everyone that's doing, um, making money <laughs> with Modic the, the modic shops or modic agency i'm not sure what what exactly they're called um mm -hmm. they should really try and get those references you know and kind of maybe punch yeah. a little bit above your weight in a way <laughs> and like to get these bigger brands bigger logos and be able to yeah. tell these stories you know it's these stories right. that the marketing team that ruth is talking about mm -hmm. they need the stories you know yeah, we do have a very basic case study section, which has been mainly populated by our partners. So if you go mm -hmm. to mortic.org forward slash case hyphen studies, I think it is off the top of my head, um, you'll be able to find some of the case studies they have created. But yeah, there's an open task as well in the marketing team to create a pitch deck to enable agencies who are selling Mortic to have those kind of awesome examples of brands who, who have switched to Mortic or who are using it really successfully you know, particularly if they don't have that um, history themselves, they can say like, this is what people are doing. I think you have a similar thing in Drupal. Um, I think that's probably where we pinched the idea from actually. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. that's okay. It's open source. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, All collecting right. these case studies and always aiming for bigger and bigger examples, I think is key, you know? Yeah. Okay, so we have like another question here and the other question we have is, how did Drupal gain so many partners and financial supporters? Well, that's a great question. Um, first of all, it took a while, <laughs> but ultimately, I think I think a lot of partners are, you know, coin operated for lack of a better term. Like they felt they could make money with Drupal. You know, that's the best way to attract a lot of uh, partners. So. Um, and then once you have a lot of people making money with Drupal, um, it's about you know converting them to become contributors, and um, that takes a lot of uh, different uh, efforts. But like some of the things that we have done, that Modic is starting to do as well, because um, we, we you know we talked about these things in the past. But um, is we promote those that give back, you know, mm -hmm. and. The thing is everybody is after the same, every Drupal company, every Modic company is after the same, which is business, you know, they wanna get leads uh, so they can do another project and maybe grow their business or even stay flat, that's fine too, but everybody wants leads. <laughs> um, and so we put in place some incentives for those people that contribute uh, we give them more visibility and recognition on the Drupal website, as an example. Um, and that's an incentive for other people to contribute because it's a benefit, right? Like, so we're trying to add benefits, like, all right, if you do this, here's a bunch of benefits that you get that will help you 
achieve your goals, which most often is, um, you know, making money. Um, that's mm -hmm. not exclusively making money, but <laughs> it's a, often a big part of why people, um, you know, contribute, I think, you know, like it helps them <laughs> in deals. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's make it interesting for people to be great businesses with Modic, you know, make it a project that they, you know, like, like Marketo to Modic replacements. I, I feel like I'm kind of hammering on Marketo and it's definitely not just Marketo out there, but, you know, like re replacing Marketo, Marketo instances with Modic should be like a win-win for the, for the customer and for the agency kind of thing. And you can do a lot of those. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, so that's really a nice answer. And uh, we have like another question here. How do you become a multi community partner? Yeah, so this is a relatively new thing. We just launched it about three months ago. So to become a community partner, you need to be financially supporting Maltec either through GitHub sponsors or through Open Collective. So there's two different ways you can support us. And the amount that you need to be contributing each month is proportionate to something called the Big Mac Index, So, which I never knew existed until I heard of it in Joomla. But it basically takes the cost of a Big Mac in that country and uses that as a metric to figure out proportionately how much something costs. And so we have all that information on the blog post where we announced about the partner program. In the US, it's $100 a month. In other countries, it will be like $40 to $50 a month in your equivalent currency. So you have to support us financially for at least three months. And you have to be active okay. in the community. So there's two elements. There's the financial side and there's also the practical side. So that might be contributing in GitHub, so making pull requests, adding features, bug fixes. It could be helping people on the forums. So one of our partners, their activity is just responding and being helpful on the forums. Um, it could be being involved on Slack, leading a team, running a meetup. But we need to see consistent activity over three months. And then there's a little form you can fill in where you show us how you meet those criteria. And then we review that on a monthly basis. And on the website, if you look at the partners, it's on the top of the menu. But they're ranked based on their activity that month, the previous month. So each month they can shuffle around based on how active those organizations yeah. have been contributing. Great, great. Uh, okay, that's really nice one. Uh, how do I contribute to Motic? Since you had mentioned about uh, me to contribute to be part of the Motic community partner, mm -hmm. so how does someone contribute to Motic? Yeah, so, I mean, financially, I just mentioned Open Collective GitHub sponsors. You can do that individually and fund OSS as well at the moment. In terms of contributing practically, um, there are lots of different ways you can do that. If you go to contribute.mortic.org, that's our community handbook. And there's a section in there that says um, contributing to Mortic, I think. It gives you a bit of information about how you can contribute to Mortic in the different roles that we have and the different teams. And there's also a community room in this event. So you can also hop in there and ask any questions there. And there's a few other resources there. Um, teams are all based on Slack. So if you join Slack at mortic.org slash Slack, I have to say that slowly because it's quite, quite a mouth turner, isn't it? Um, you'll be able to join the teams and they all start with T hyphen and then the team name. So it's also a good idea just to hop into the team and join a team meeting, for example. Great. Uh, okay, so the last question, um, because we have like another section coming up. How opportun uh -huh. What opportunities are there in Mautic at the moment for paid contributions? Yeah, so we have a couple of tasks open at the moment on GitHub. If you look in the issues, you'll see that there's a label called bounties. Okay. So you can filter by that, and that will tell you any issues that have open uh, bounties. At the moment, I think there's around about five hundred dollars worth in total. One of those one of those issues is two hundred and fifty dollars in itself. Um, we've also got some tasks open on Upwork at the moment for helping with the great JS builder because we have a couple of tasks that the community volunteers haven't been able to get around to working on. So if you have experience with developing with great JS, you could have a look at those. 
and also some of our initiatives. If you come to the keynote tomorrow, I'll be mentioning some of the initiatives where we need more help. And we have funding available, $1,000 for each initiative per year um, to work on tasks relating to that. So that's another opportunity for funded work. And also working with any of the agencies. Every single agency I've spoken to, particularly our partners, are super, super busy and would love work, you know, people to help work with them. So it's also worth reaching out to them if you're looking for paid employment where you can contribute to the community. Okay, great. Uh, it does, yes. and that's it. We've um, answered all the questions. Um, okay, so uh, thanks, okay. Ruth and Grace. I, I don't know if I pronounce that well. Grace. Dreams. Yeah, it's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I'm sure this section was very helpful to people who wants to contribute to open source and you know looking for different ways to contribute. Our companies who are part of open source and looking for ways to sustain the open source project and how to go around mm -hmm. it. So I'm pretty sure this section was very very useful to them and me as well. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay, so bye. Round. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye. Bye.